Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are advised that the following program contains images and voices of people who have died. Welcome to Four Corners, where tonight we go inside some of Australia's remotest Indigenous communities for an unflinching look at why they're struggling to survive. These dysfunctional communities have the most depressing living conditions imaginable. They are a disgrace to Australia and all those who have a prosperous way of life. Knowing what I know, it's very difficult to sleep at night and knowing that we cannot protect those children in any effective way. They've been neglected by successive governments. This is something Australia has to come to terms with and it's not an answer just to shut them down. A furious debate has been raging over the future of Australia's remote Indigenous communities after Prime Minister Tony Abbott described living there as a lifestyle choice. The tumult springs from the federal government's decision to cut funding to the states for remote communities and Western Australia's plan to close at least some of them as a result. In going behind the noise and the headbutting, our team travelled across the remote Kimberley region and found communities blighted by grinding poverty, few job opportunities, chronic alcohol and drug abuse and in some cases endemic sexual and physical violence, including against children. Not much in the way of lifestyle. But what better alternative is either government offering? When the rug has been pulled from under communities like these in the past, often it's just been a case of shifting the problem. This report from Debbie Whitmont. There are few places more remote than the far north of Western Australia and few people live further away from our big cities than those in the remote communities of the Kimberley. It's the beginning of the dry season and we're on our way to one of the remotest, a small community on the edge of the desert. At the end of the road, you'll find Jugaridi, a collection of about 20 houses, some community buildings and a primary school. Peter Murray was brought here as a baby. I loved it being out here on country, um, <clears throat> learning my traditional ways on how to hunt and collect bush tucker uh, with my mum. And she taught me a lot of, uh, a lot of survival skills. Until the 1980s, the community, the Walmajari people, like many others, lived and worked on a cattle station. Um, we lived in tin shacks um, right through from the 70s to 80s until the community leaders wanted something more, more of their own to have ownership um, within the community. These days, Peter Murray runs Jugaridi's Ranger Program, a scheme funded by the federal government to train people in conservation and land management and help them stay in touch with their country. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what are you, Peter? How are you? Yeah, good. It's like a gateway to having access to our land through the Ranger Project and having our people go back to country, have access, and, and, and learning about more about of the traditional way. As well as providing training, the Ranger program has created four of the very few jobs in Jugaridi. Three, four, five. And then one down here. Now you put it on the card. How much there? That is five point zero. 
it doesn't take long to drive around Jugaridi. And it's easy to see that over the years, millions of dollars of government money have been spent here. There are good vehicles and buildings, a big generator, and a fully equipped workshop. As you can see, the community is fully resourced with offices, schools, shop, workshop, but we need, uh, we need contractors to try and secure employment. Five years ago, the federal government labelled Jugaridi as unsustainable. Peter Murray fears that if the community loses its government funding, it won't survive. That's going to take away all the jobs. Um, for the community members themselves that, who are employed with the school and the ranger program. Um, That'll so leave almost nobody it'll, employed. It'll leave no one employed, yeah. To pay the rent um, in those houses and power as well. So. That'll be the end. Yep. Like many remote communities, Jugaridi's population varies. It's hard to know how many people live here full time. It was school holidays and a weekend, but all day we saw only two people. People might think it's an expensive form of housing for such a small number of people. Well, this is home. This is home to a lot of other family groups and the reason why we built this community is to have ownership in our own area. Most young people have left Jugaridi. It's hardly surprising. There's nothing to do. There's very no jobs, few. no. No, so it's very hard for it's young people. It's real, real hard for young people to um, secure employment here. Peter Murray lives in another, less isolated community and they're just as worried about the future. Joy Springs has a population of about 50, nearly all from the same big family. Our grandfather made rules, really strong rules, that everybody obeyed by um, when he was here, and we carried on that rule. No alcohol and no drugs within the community, and to, be, to make it as safe as we can, um, for the future of our kids. Chantelle Murray says that living in a community close to town, but also well away from it, is the best of both worlds, especially for kids. <laughs> we walk in both worlds and we educate our kids in both worlds. They get their education in schools each week. We educate them on country each weekend. At the moment, Joy Springs' overall power bill is subsidised by the federal government. But the day we visited, trenches were being dug to put separate metres in individual houses. There's a real fear that people won't be able to pay for their power and the community will close. It is a big issue and we're afraid that we're going to be all pushed into town and that's where we'll have a lot of issues, you know. Like what? Like arguments between, you know, groups and stuff, language groups and stuff. Yeah. It's just going to create a big, big problem in town. Our kids getting into a lot of mischief stuff and our kids, young kids, might be getting into a lot of drugs and alcohol in an early age, you know. Whereas here they can't have access to any of those things. Do you worry about that? I'm very worried. As a mother, I am, yeah. The nearest town, Fitzroy Crossing, has been notorious for drinking. Elder Joe Brown has lost more friends and family than he can count to suicide and alcohol. When you drove along that road, you see all the cross. That's what the alcohol do to the people. You know, died in the road by accident. 
These days, Fitzroy Crossing has restrictions on the sale of full-strength alcohol. But there's still plenty of drinking, both in pubs and on the sly. Well, they get it on way. Not in pub. To Joe Brown, the threat of community closures sounds like history repeating. Fifty years ago, he and others were loaded onto tractors and dumped in Fitzroy Crossing. Right at the side of that crossing, and that's why that people would dump it there. Make them get off there while you got to stay here now. You might have got to find your way. They put us on these trucks and took us down to Fitzroy Crossing. Um, Everyone was told to get off the property and a lot of our old people died, you know, on that move. For many years before that, Joe Brown had worked as a stockman. Until the 1960s, he was paid only two pounds a month. In the 1960s, the unions brought a case for equal pay for Aboriginal workers on stations. And that case was successful. And uh, there was a, an award that the, they had to be fully paid, the same as white stockmen. The outcome of that was that many stations, not all, many stations simply ejected their Aboriginal communities and left them, as I say, dumped them on the edge of town. And the social results were catastrophic. Conditions were so bad that a series of federal governments began encouraging people to move back to their country and funded remote communities or homelands. But according to Fred Cheney, who was then Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, the question of who should continue to pay for remote communities was never resolved. This really started as a fight over whether it was a Commonwealth or a state responsibility to deliver municipal services in remote communities. This fight's been going on for many years. It's been handled very badly, I think, by both governments. They've not been able to reach agreement. So this year, the Commonwealth put a gun to the state's head. Last year, the Prime Minister said his government wouldn't pay any longer and offered Western Australia a final lump sum of $90 million. What we can't do uh, is endlessly subsidise lifestyle choices if those lifestyle choices are not conducive to the kind of full participation in Australian society that everyone should have. That comment and the West Australian Premier's threat of mass community closures sparked national protests. If you want to listen, and if you want to put yourself for just a moment in my shoes, I don't pretend... But it was the Premier's next justification for the closures that really triggered anger. And those communities, 273 of them, are not sustainable into the future. They cannot look anyone in the face and guarantee the safety of little boys and girls. Mr Speaker, in 2013, there were 39 cases of gonorrhoea in Aboriginal children. Mr Speaker, these 39 cases were in children from 10 to 14. Well, I think there's a lot of sort of justifying what you're going to do by whatever arguments happen to be available. I mean, the sort of things that the state government's been talking about, including abuse of children, has been around for very many years. The name of one Kimberley community has become synonymous with abuse and despair. It became so bad that at the end of last year, that community wasn't just closed, but demolished. Personally, I couldn't believe that the Western Australian government would demolish a town. I was still struggling to believe that they'd closed the town and, and evicted people. The community of Umbulgari used to be on the far side of the Forest River, in the remote northeast of the Kimberley. Tammy Solonek, a lawyer who investigated the community's closure for Amnesty International, was one of the last people to go there. The thing that struck me, of course, is the beauty. 
As you go up on the boat, there's a stunning cliff face opposite Umbulgari. The first thing you see is one of those streets which is lined with boab trees. And in fact, one of the first things we saw was a horse. It was really eerie. It had a uncomfortable feeling connected to it. There was clearly evidence of a forced eviction, a suitcase lying in the middle of the road, a chair in the middle of the road. I couldn't believe I was standing in this, this empty town that was, was deserted. Until the late 1960s, Umbulgari was an Anglican mission. Stella Alberts was eight years old when she was stolen from her mother and taken to what was then called Forest River Mission. We had to go to school, go to church every day, morning and night. And we get used to be locked up in the dormitory, night time. I know my grandfather told me stories about the old mission days. They had everything, so they had the piggery, they had the peanut farm, they had the veggie gardens, they had the horsemanship program, and it just seemed like a really family oriented community and everyone came together and shared and there was no alcohol. But in 1969, the mission closed. A few years later, the federal government provided funding for a new community called Umbulgari. Stella Alberts and others returned. We were all good, happy, you know. We like going out bush, camping out. We used to go out bush because we had no water in the community. For more than a decade, Floyd Grant was chair of the Umbulgari Council. He told us that life on the community was all about country and culture. He was out in the bush. He was camping, fishing, taking the kids out swimming, telling stories. What, you, what the old people tell you, you pass on to your kids. And every, every area had a special meaning to it. And it was something that we were happy to pass on to our kids because the next generation is very important for them to understand what, what that whole ground and land was, what it meant. But in reality, Umbulgari was nothing like that. Well, I guess I was first uh, introduced to the Umbulgari problem after I became commissioner in 2004. Uh, it became evident not long after that that there had been a, a long history of sex abuse of children, not just sex abuse of children, of course, family violence, uh, widespread consumption of alcohol and alcoholism, uh, lots of alcohol going into the community. So a community that was highly dysfunctional and was problematic because it was a very long way from any substantial government and other types of services. Stella Albert's 15-year-old granddaughter died in a drunken car accident. The people were hanging them, suicide, hanging themselves. Another, one, another boy got drowned at the pumping station, my nephew. All through grog, being drunk. And why was that? Why was there so much alcohol there? I don't know, because they wanted to drink a lot of alcohol. Plane loads of alcohol were being flown into Umbulgari and the planes were that heavy with alcohol that they were having trouble landing on the landing strip. Um, it was said that some people were drunk for days on end. Um, it was said that there was high rates of truancy in that children weren't attending school. Um, that the accommodation um, that Indigenous people were living in was an absolute disgrace. Umbulgari had one of the highest suicide rates in the Kimberley. In 2008, at an inquest, John Hammond represented five families whose relatives had died in the space of a year. Three were only teenagers. Young boys in particular were hanging themselves um, from sheds at the rear of properties or finding a beam to hang themselves. 
I mean, to watch a generation of Indigenous uh, children and teenagers being affected like this is devastating, particularly in a country like Australia. 16-year-old Boyd Farrer was staying at Umbulgari when he was found on the night of a big party hanging from a veranda. His grandmother, Josie Farrer, who's now a member of parliament, tried to find out what happened. And, uh, you know, I asked, because my grandson was only 16, and uh, I asked the question. I said, did you see... Did you see him out there? Oh, yeah, we seen him out there. Do you know what happened to him? Oh, no. Even people running the community? There's a lot of people that have, are keeping things hidden. According to John Hammond, the community had a culture of secrecy and intimidation, and victims were pressured not to disclose abuse to authorities. A number of young Indigenous people were afraid of speaking out because there was a culture of bullying occurring where, particularly when the regulatory authorities, such as the Department of Child Protection, sought to come to Umbulgari and find out what was going on, that they would not be allowed to stay the night or they would not be allowed to interview um, minors without an elder being present. So young people were afraid to speak out because there would be repercussions from the elders if they did. We asked Floyd Grant, who at the time was chair of the community council, whether as a leader he tried to stop the drinking and violence. Why didn't you do anything about it? Me? You were the chairman of the committee. You no, were... we couldn't do it. We couldn't do it with what happens at people's houses and that is not my job to go and, and, and interfere in their life. Police were told that at one stage there were 25 flights bringing alcohol to the community in a single week. Community members were filmed unloading large amounts of alcohol with children helping them. The police were told not to come in, the runway was blocked, the nurses were intimidated. No, no, nothing to do with that. You don't agree with that? No, that was more the that was more the alcohol. Worst of all, there was widespread sexual abuse of children. It later transpired that elders of the community were charged with sexual offences against children, and one of those elders was convicted. There was a suggestion that there was pornography being made available to children and there was a complete state of dysfunction in that community. Um, it was very, very sad. I mean, some of the information I heard actually brought a tear to my eye. Police investigated seven prominent figures in the community over sexual abuse of children. Three were convicted. Floyd Grant went to trial on eight counts of child sex abuse, but was found not guilty. I think there was a dreadful problem uh, with leadership. At times it was non-existent. Now, in my view, Umbulgari was an unsustainable community, and it is a community that I believe should be shut down. The Minister for Aboriginal Affairs agreed. Services like the clinic and the school were closed in 2011. And at the end of last year, Umbulgari was demolished. Um, Umbulgari was a difficult decision for me. There was um, systemic issues with regard to the governance of the community and abuse, alcoholism. Um, and as a result of that, there was only one conclusion and that was that the community needed to close. I think that what happened with Umbulgari was a form of collective punishment. I think it was trying to send a strong message to Aboriginal communities that if you're going to be dysfunctional, uh, we'll, we'll close you down. And it's a really authoritarian, top-down, top-heavy approach, which isn't going to work. 
Tammy Solonek argues that Umbulgari could have been saved by earlier intervention. We have to remember why these places are so remote. They've been neglected by successive governments. They've been allowed to have uh, unlimited liquor restrictions when they know it's damaging to people. The, the housing and infrastructure has been, able, been left to neglect. This is something Australia has to come to terms with and it's not an answer just to shut them down. The conditions... But lawyer John Hammond says there are still other communities just as bad as Umbulgari and he argues that they too should be closed. There are other Umbulgaris and I've visited them. Um, they have the most depressing living conditions imaginable. They are, to, are, are a disgrace to Australia and all those who have a prosperous way of life. For as long as you have communities that don't enjoy the same standards of living as us, then we're not a compassionate society. We've got to try and uplift everyone who's living in poverty or is suffering some sort of abuse. We've got to do this together as a community. You can't have separate enclaves of people living in terrible, dysfunctional communities. The West Australian Police Commissioner says he knows that even now children are being abused in some remote communities, though he won't say which ones. We know that many of those communities are highly dysfunctional, that children are being sexually abused every day. We know, for argument's sake, that in Aboriginal communities, the rate of abuse is 10 times higher than anywhere else in the Australian community. And we're not able to be vigilant and monitor those situations like we might in a metropolitan area or a larger country centre because of their remoteness. The Commissioner backs up the Premier's call for closures in the Kimberley. Police officers up there have said to me on more than one occasion that they cannot sleep at night worrying about what's happening in those communities, communities that they're supposed to be responsible for protecting. The same applies to me. Knowing what I know, it's very difficult to sleep at night uh, knowing that we cannot protect those children in any effective way and the sorts of responses we've seen in terms of offering some level of protection is, for argument's sake, contraceptive implants in 11 or 12 year olds. Surely that's the last line of defence when you can do nothing else protect to protect these girls from sexual activity. is if communities are closed, what happens to the people in them? When Umbulgari closed, Stella Alberts and her family had to camp out in the marshland. She finally got a house in the town of Wyndham. But others are still living as fringe dwellers. I think what most Australians understand though is that living on the edge of town in a dump, having nowhere to live, nowhere to, to wash, uh, no facilities to live a decent life, every Australian can see that's wrong. And that's what I'm fearful of about this closure of communities. That's what's happened in the past. We've dumped people on the edge of town and left them to rot. And I think it would be criminal if we did that again. In the Kimberley holiday town of Broome, it's happening already, away from the tourist strip. Even now, every night in Broome, as many as 150 people from remote communities are sleeping rough, in parks, on the roadside, and in front of shops. Come over and we'll, uh, Broome Shire President Graham Campbell is worried about the human cost of community closures. Hello, can we have a chat to you guys about uh, where you've been sleeping uh, around Broome? You, wherever you can find somewhere to sleep? I'm a homeless. You're a homeless person? Some people, they come to town, they, know, they don't know where to... There's nowhere sleep. for them to go. Yeah, so. no, nowhere to sleep. Yeah. They had to sleep in there. Somewhere in the bush. Yeah, in the mangroves or yeah, under the yeah. under the buildings or yeah, wherever you can find. Yeah, yeah. 
And what do you do? You hide your bed clothes and uh, some some security car to come around, wake us up in the five o'clock in the morning to let us wake up. Move on. Yeah. So you get moved on by people around town wherever you're sleeping. Yeah. yeah. Graham Campbell estimates that with mass closures, the number of brooms homeless could more than double. 350 people sleeping rough in communities who I think totally unacceptable and needs to be addressed, not in the longer term, but in the shorter term. That's one issue that, that will certainly have an impact on the towns in the, and the communities in town. Even now, Campbell says Broome's run-down Aboriginal communities are struggling under pressure from out-of-towners. It's virtually an invasion of people that are humbugging the people that in there who are... There's some families in there trying their best. And then they get swamped with people from outside and that causes the dysfunction and that causes over uh, over uh, population, the amount of people in houses. It's not uncommon to have 18 or 20 people in a house, which in at best could be described as being barely livable. What do you think my Lord? I'm sorry if you make mistakes. Should have been something could have been done about these houses. But nobody we don't get funding from anyway. It's hard to believe that Ray Wiggins house is only a few hundred meters from the center of Broome. But even with these conditions. He told us that every night he's fighting off people with nowhere else to stay. They have no place. They're from the desert. They're from somewhere else. They're wild people. Are they drinking? <laughs> drinking? They drink like a fish. We saw some of them the next morning, sleeping outside near the road. What do they do up there? Drink and swear and fight all night and day. I've been walking around my creek way. Yeah, yeah. I was looking around for that one girl. Yeah. And when the tin kite comes, when the tide comes blow, mama, 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 I won't get you. Mama, 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 mama. In recent years, many Kimberley communities have declared themselves dry, and many towns now restrict the sale of full strength alcohol. But Broome is different, and that, as the Chamber of Commerce admits, has made it a draw card for drinkers. So, not being able to get the alcohol that they want to drink. They've moved from those communities and they have moved into Broome and they are part of our itinerant population here that we have now. So it's moved the problem, not necessarily solved it. But the Chamber of Commerce doesn't want liquor restrictions. I think it's, it's not going to work. Um, the difficulty is we're a tourist town. Most people, when they go on holidays, want to be able to enjoy themselves and they certainly don't want to be told what they can and can't, can't drink. That's not the Australian way. By 10.30 in the morning, Broome's pubs are doing good business and quite a few, black and white, are already waiting for the bottle shops, which open at 11. <laughs> One voluntary restriction is that broom bottle shops only sell drive-in alcohol. So people who don't have cars catch taxis. We have the itinerant people on the streets. A lot of those are affected by alcohol and so therefore um, often are violent and angry. 
we quite get them coming down our alley here, um, fornicating, having sex, urinating, um, defecating, everything that you don't want to see. And of course, I don't want to see my I don't want my customers or people coming to Brooms uh, having to um, to be confronted with that. In the last five years, there have been nine murders in Broome, many involving people from remote communities. Police concede there's been an unprecedented rise in murders in the past few years. Locals are blaming people from outlying communities for the problem. Seven of the eight victims were Aboriginal. It's very unfortunate that these murders have occurred. Uh, basically, alcohol is a major factor. All of those were from what I call regional drift, and that's an issue. The comment of a lifestyle choice made by uh, the Prime Minister is not how the truth really is. These are people that are trying to live in a socially disadvantaged uh, position. Sometimes they may well need a prod to be able to go forward. We can't have generations of kids without proper education and proper future, um, as I see it. But I would be very disappointed if the concept of connection to country was lost. Images like these of Cable Beach that help bring Broome about $140 million every year in tourism. But now the head of the Kimberley Land Council is threatening to occupy Cable Beach to stop community closures. I'd be happy that if we move our community on Cable Beach and just camp on Cable Beach um, because we've always been out of mind, out of sight and be pushed away. It'll kill the tourism industry. Are you serious? Would you be prepared to go that far? To kill, I am serious. That, to kill um, the tourist industry? To bring their attention. To? So we're going to the UN to bring their attention to the Australian government in their handling of Indigenous affairs. And I'd be happy to, to camp for weeks and months on Cable Beach. In the last few days, the West Australian government announced a new plan for remote communities. Good, look, uh, thank you very much for coming along this morning. It's uh, promising well, consultation and better use of resources. Though much of it seems vague, it's hard to argue that there isn't a need for change. Well, I think uh, it'd take a very brave person anywhere in this nation to uh, prosecute an argument that would say that outcomes for Aboriginal people um, are what they should be. Essentially, um, the status quo can't prevail, particularly here in Western Australia and in our regional and remote communities, the status quo just simply cannot prevail. We've got to a move to a situation where the outcomes are more positive. The government promises there is no hit list for remote communities. We have a large number of communities, 274 remote communities. Quite frankly, I think that is too many. Have I got a figure, a, a predetermined figure that says, well, this is ideal? No, I haven't. I want to confirm that and guarantee that. I do not have any figure. Um, there, is, there is no notion, there is no line in the sand, there is no list on remote communities in terms of potential closure. But the government says communities will need to show what it calls sustainability. What do you mean by sustainability? Sustainability depends on whether or not the community can provide a safe, nurturing environment for the children. It can provide job opportunities and training uh, and, uh, and um, um, outcomes for the entire community. Over the Kimberley, communities are worried about their future. It's clear that many will struggle to survive. But some are optimistic. The community of Pandanus Park is about 60 kilometres south of Derby. A few years ago, it was being torn apart by alcohol. A lot of drinking. 
Um, you know, kids, some of the kids wouldn't be going to school. Some of the household wouldn't have food to, you know, feed the kids. Um, the kids would, some of the kids would get neglected, you know, stay in other family members' homes while their parents was just drinking and just doing their own thing and not worrying about the kids, you know. It was quite dysfunctional. They've now got a wonderful board of directors. They've got great vision. And their vision is that they want to be self-sufficient. They want to build the capacity. They want businesses. And they want their kids to learn. Pandanus Park banned alcohol. And for the last 18 months, Susan Murphy has been working with the community's leaders. Now, a community-run school breakfast program is turning the school attendance rate from one of the worst in the region to one of the best. Trust one another and listen to each other. This is for my family in Kananara. This is I don't believe any community deserves to close. I think everybody needs to stand up and, and be accountable and take um, responsibility for their communities and for what actually happens within the communities. That's why each community has a governing council. It won't be easy to provide every opportunity in remote communities, especially for young people, but it isn't impossible. Sometimes you'll find that the young ones will leave, but at the end of the day, you've got to look at what's there for them. You know, what have they got? Um, in a lot of our communities, we've got people that will say, well, yeah, you can become a, you can become a ranger and look after country, but not everybody wants to do that. We've never given them the choice to say, well, do you want to write a book? Do you want to become a movie star? Or would you like to be a hairdresser? Those choices aren't given, and it's not impossible to give them those choices. In many communities, those choices won't be possible until solutions are found to other problems like alcohol and drugs. We have a massive problem here with ice. And yes, we do have some of those that come in the, from the remote communities already that are already hooked on the ice. They're hooked on um, you know, amphetamines. They're hooked on the alcohol. But the challenges for remote communities won't be solved simply by mass closures. Nor can they be solved entirely by governments. Some believe it's time for Aboriginal people to step up. As an Aboriginal woman, um, I'm of the opinion that we can't keep giving the handouts. But at the end of the day, there are some of us out there that are saying, well, enough's enough. We have to start standing up. We've got to be responsible for our own actions and our own decisions. And if we want the same as we get in a town, we need to start fighting for it. But we've also got to start showing governments that's local, state and Commonwealth, that we can do it. There's one challenge, but with it the inarguable reality that it won't be met by some overnight miracle. How will government step up to avoid another round of the same vicious cycle? Next week, Fast and Furious, America's covert operations selling guns to the Mexican drug cartels. Until then, good night. <laughs>